words. He said, go with the strength you have. Now, he didn't say, go with the strength you're going to have. I'm going to make you into this transformer person. But he didn't say that, did he? He said, go with the strength you have. We, you know, we have strength. But he said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. And then here's the second teaser that's on your list. It said, I am sending you. I am sending you. See, we'll see Gideon's response in, to the Lord here in a little bit. But the same thing is, is that we ask the same things when we have those questions. And you ask the Lord, Lord, why would... Why would, you know, it seems like I'm supposed to do something, but why would you be sending me? Why would you be sending me? You know, these are the same questions we'd ask ourselves in our brain. You'd say this, well, surely there's somebody more qualified than me to do that. Surely there's somebody more qualified. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's somebody that has a better education or more specific education than that. Why would you be sending me? Because I'm sure there are people more educated. And I know I don't have any time. Why would you be asking me to do it? I don't have any time. And I'm not even suited to that kind of task. That's crazy. But then what Gideon turned around and asked him, he said, how can I rescue Israel? Because he cites as we go through, because we're in this flyover part now, okay, that I told you about. And he says, why, Lord? How can I rescue him? Because... The, the family group that I'm in, we're not well considered. We're not powerful people. And I'm the least, I'm this youngest, like know-nothing kid of my family even. So why would you pick me out to do that? And the Lord told him as he went on down in, in, chapter, in verse 16, we're I think probably in 7 now, I'm not sure. But the Lord said to him, I will be with you. That was the answer he gave him, I will be with you. Well, Gideon's like us, like me. Because what he did is he, he said, okay, so I had all this stuff happen, and it seems really real. But then uh, the other side of the coin, I'm going, I, maybe this isn't even God talking to me, okay? Maybe it's coming out of my own personality or something I heard down at the grocery store or whatever. But, you know, maybe, maybe it's not even God. So, God, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, I want you to show me a sign. I want you to show me a sign. See, oftentimes, that's what we desire too, isn't it? Because we kind of think, okay, I think I'm on God's track here. I think I'm on God's track, and, but I want him to show me a sign. That how do we know thing, that's a big question. I don't, you know, I don't know about you, but I've heard it a lot of times in my life. I've asked it a lot of times in my life. Well, how do I know if that's the Lord's will? How do I know that's the Lord talking to me? Or maybe it's my pride or something else that's getting in the way. There's a short verse in John 10, and I like it. It says this. It says, it's Jesus talking. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched a show. You know, Karen and I do this every once in a while. We'll, go, we'll watch some show and say, ah, I recognize that voice, but who is that person? You know, years have passed, maybe different difference in who they are. But it's amazing to me that, that what you do, you can't maybe place the actor, but you know you recognize that voice. And, you know, we, we, have, we can cheat. You know, I have my iPad there. I just look up and find out who they are. That's what I do. But the reality is they didn't have an iPad, but, but the reality for us and for them is they had to figure out, well, how do I know that that's the Lord's voice? This isn't an all-inclusive answer, but I'm going to give you some thoughts I have. Here's one of the reasons and how, how we do it. One is you spend time with them. You spend time with them. You know, baby Theo that's in our family now, he's a year and four months or whatever. But, you know, no older than he is, he knows who it is that's speaking to him. He recognizes the voice. He'll turn. He'll, he'll respond to that. But you know why? It's because we've spent time with him. And that's the same way with the Lord. If, we, if we're going to hear the Lord's voice, we have to spend time with him. We have to listen to him. We crowd it out a lot of times with a whole bunch of other stuff. And then the next thing we need to do besides just spending time with him 
And I don't mean to spend time talking to him. We need to talk to him. But, man, we, we need to spend a lot of time listening to him. And then the next thing we need to do is we need to verify the voice when we hear what comes to our spirit or we believe it's in our spirit and we're trying to verify that. We need to pay attention and say, is that consistent with God's word? Because if it isn't, why in the world would he ask me to do something that doesn't line up with God's word? He wouldn't. So that consistency, again, is another way to know if that's a Lord's voice, if that's a spirit that's guiding you. So Gideon decides, back to the scripture, Gideon decides he's going to offer a sacrifice. So he gets a goat, makes some bread, he goes down and he takes it down and he puts it in front of the Lord's angel, which is the Lord. And he puts it in front of him and, and when he did, he presented it to the angel underneath this great tree that scripture just told us about a while ago. Then the angel, with his staff, he touched that sacrifice and it immediately just disappeared in this ball of flames. And then the Lord angel disappeared. Now, that night, the Lord said this to Gideon. Remember, he's, he's kind of got him on task, right? Gideon's kind of wish he didn't have to do it, but he's got him on task. And that night, the Lord said to Gideon, he said, so here's what I want you to do, Gideon. Remember all this stuff you guys do? You, you've fallen away from me again. I want you to go out because there have been, even at your father's house, that you have created these altars of, for Baal and for Asherah. Now, those altars and this pole of Asherah were primarily for, had to do with uh, agriculture and, and, and fertility. Those were the things that were the primary things in my mind for those. But, but those were the things that this group tended to hang on to. He said, and here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to go out, Gideon. I want you to go out and I want you to pull down those altars. I want you to wreck those altars. And then in their place, I want you to put an altar to me in that very place. So he said, you know, I guess what I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to do that. I'm going to have to sacrifice a bull. I'm going to have to put that there. And then, oh, by the way, the Lord wants me to go ahead and use for firewood one of those altars. So now he's really going to get me deep into this deal. But that night he was afraid. He was afraid to do it uh, because he thought, what's going to happen? But he finally come, summoned up the courage and he, at the, in, in the cover of darkness, he sneaks out and he destroys both of those. Now, the people of the community, of course, when they got up, they see something's gone. They immediately put two and two together and they know this is Gideon. So they show up at his house. And he's telling his father, hey, we know your kid did this. Bring him out because he needs to die. He has had the nerve to tear down these, these altars to our gods with a little G. Now, teaser three that you have on your list is this. It's called bold step. Because sometimes, you know, maybe not even comfortable I'm I'm a kind of brash person okay so doing something bold usually is, I don't do it well a lot of times and a lot of times it catches up with me because I kind of get out there and then I got to figure out how to reel myself back but in this case a lot of us you know we're trying to say how do I take a bold step that's really not in my nature and, and how am I supposed to do that but sometimes we need to take a bold step just think about that say so what if what if God shows up if he hadn't already shown up in your life and asked you this, and he said, oh, by the way, I'm sending you. Ooh. See, that's what Gideon's already heard. Now what he's doing, he said, now not only have I said I'm going to send you, but now I expect you to execute on the command I've given you. Not only do I want to send you, now I want you to go do something, and I've told you. And he did that. That's what, what about getting rid of the idols was about. And so he took that bold step. When we get on down in the scripture, Gideon asked for a sign. It talks about, we're going to get there in a second, but what happened is, is the armies of the Midians and the Amaleks and the people of the east had formed an alliance against Israel. In other words, they were going to gang up on them. And they had crossed the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. And at this point, 
Scripture tells us that the Lord clothed Gideon with power. Now, did he wrap something around him? I don't know. But I do know that, guess what? We can be clothed with power too. It's not just a Gideon thing. But he, he clothed Gideon with power. Then what Gideon asked him, and you, you, you may have heard these stories before, he said, Lord, I, okay, I, I got to have some clear direction here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a fleece with just a piece of wool. He said, I'm going to take a fleece, and I'm going to put it down on the ground. And so when night comes, what I want to happen is I want that fleece to, stay, to be wet, and then all the ground around it to be dry. And if that happens, I'll look at that and say, well, that's an anomaly. That's different. So, okay, so... Oh, yeah, we're going to battle. And you know, I don't, Karen and I have done this a couple times in our life. I'm not going to spend time on that today, but if you ever wonder about how that kind of works in real life, we'll talk to you about that. But, but then, sure enough, you get up the next morning. Guess what? Amazing. The fleece is wet. The ground's dry. And then he's kind of like me. Maybe kind of like some of you. He says, oh, okay. But what if that was an accident? What if that didn't really happen? So he said, now, Lord, I don't want you to get angry with me, okay? Don't get angry at me, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to, let's just flip it around. So tonight, I want to get up, and then we'll have dew on the grass, but that fleece will be completely dry. First night, you know, when he got up, he got, as Scripture says, he got up and he actually rang the water out of it, it was so wet. Not enough clue for him, so now we're back to stage two. So let's do it the other way. So sure enough, he got up the next day and went out. I'm sure he, I don't know if you, how much he slept, but he got up and he went out there. And sure enough, it was dry. And he understood, okay, I take that. It is you. It's not a fig newton of my imagination. I'm going to go on with what you told me to do. You've told me to lead this army and free these people. So Gideon prepares to engage his enemies. In chapter 7, verse 2, it says this, The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many warriors with you. If I let all the people fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to them that they have saved themselves by their own strength. Sounds possible, doesn't it? So, what's he do? He says, Now, you have a, you have a good army. The count was about 32,000 people. He said, you have a good army, but just guess what? If, in fact, we prevail, I mean, God knows they were, you know, we're going to prevail, but he's basically saying, if we're going to prevail and do this, and if we do that with all these troops, guess who will take the credit? You guys will take the credit. You won't give me, God, the credit. You'll take the credit. So he said, that's not going to work. He said, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to call all of them together. And he said, what I want you to do, and he said, I want you to just say out loud. I can't imagine what would happen in, in the military today, but he said this. He said, tell the people, if you're timid or afraid to go into battle, go home. Pretty weird thing, start a war, right? But that's what he told him. And you know what? Out of 32,000 people left, or out of 32,000 people in the troop, 22,000 went home. Now he's got 10,000. Now understand now, he, this army that he's going to face is lots, lots bigger in magnitude than his own. Now, so that leaves there's 10,000 of the 32,000 that are willing to fight. And, you know, just kind of God's style. Here he goes again. He tells God, he said, you know, Gideon, you still have too many people. Now, history will tell us that the other force was about 120,000 people. But he's telling him that 10,000 people is still too many people. So here's, he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take them all down to the spring, and, I'm gonna ha and I want you to tell them all to get a drink. Now, what's going to happen, he said, is people are going to choose two different methods of doing this. He said, some are just going to get down on their knees and stick their face in the water, and they're going to drink from the stream. He said, but there's a smaller group which you're actually going to do it kind of like I learned to do it. And that's what you do is you get water and you get it in your hand and you drink out of your cupped hand. He said, there's a smaller group that's going to do that. And he said, I want you to separate it. Once they do that, 
you separate the ones that drink straight from the stream and you separate the ones out that drank from the cupped hand. Well, when it finished, only 300 of them drank from the cupped hand. And true to God's form, he wanted the credit, not man to take the credit. He says, there you go. He said, those 300, that's your fighting force. Those are the ones that stay. Send the other 9,700 away. Send them on home. He said, the Lord said, he said, with these 300 men, I will rescue and give you victory. See, it was evident that the Lord wanted the victory, and he wanted to make sure that the people understood that this was a God thing, not a man thing. That's your, that's your fourth teaser. It's this. It's, it's that only, some, only something that the Lord could do, only something that the Lord could do, not the, not the skill, not the number of soldiers or an overwhelming force. So now they're ready. He's got 300 guys. And so what he does is he and his friend Pura, they sneak down to this camp. And I mean, there's soldiers and warriors every place, camels and tents. It's huge. And they think, okay, well, I'm going to go down and scout it out. So the two of them go down at night, and, and they're, they're there, and they hear overhear this conversation. Now, he's overlooking this, this, this uh, overwhelming force and scripture said it looked like a swarm of locusts there were so many people in this valley preparing to, to take on the Israelites but Gideon and Pura overheard a dream and the interpretation of the dream it's, a, it's about a barley loaf you can go in and read it but what they understood was they were listening to these guys and one of the guys said I had a dream and in that dream this is what happened and I know what that means I, it means that people of Israel, the, those are God's people. They're going to roll over us. They're going to take us. We're going to be demolished. And so Gideon is greatly encouraged by that. So what he does is he goes back to his village or to, to, to his people, and here's what he told them. He said, we have ram's horns. That was kind of a communication device. And had a, we have ram's horns, and a lot of the people, he'd had the ones that went home early, he'd had them leave theirs if they had them. So they had, they had enough for all 300 people. And then he had these, these clay pots, and in that he had a torch inside of it. And he said, here's what we're going to do. He said, we're going to break up into three groups, and we're going to sneak around the perimeter so that we're all around the perimeter of that camp. And, and at a time that I'm going to give you, what we're going to do is we'll break the jars, that will expose the light, we'll blow the horns, and then, they had, and then they were going to yell at the top of their lungs, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. So he said, that's what we're going to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, I've done a few things on faith in my life, and I thought, whew, how's this going to work out? But, you know, in this situation, you're thinking, okay, we've got these 300 guys, probably not the most highly skilled, it's the people that... I mean, you know, hey, Gideon, how'd you pick your people? Well, I just figured out how they drank water out of the stream. That's how I picked them out. What? That would make no sense. But see, the Lord understood this was the group that would follow him and do whatever they were supposed to do. So they broke the jars, exposed the light, blew the horns, yelled at the top of their lungs. And this amazing thing happened in the camp. There was this frenzy that, that started and the guys started killing each other. I mean, it's they're the same people. I mean, you know, his people hadn't even gone into the camp. They got so excited, they, they started running around. They saw people running around. They just started hacking each other up. And what, a, what happened in the, as a result of that, between the ones that were killed and the ones that just fled, only about 10% of that, that huge army was even left. Now... He chased them. There's, you can go read in 6, 7, and 8 about that. He chased them. They secured them. They found the, they found the leaders. You can put the two and two together. So now they've come back together. And what happened was kind of what we'd probably expect to happen. I mean, you know, hey, this guy's a hero. He's led us against the measurable odds. It'll be a story that'll be told forever. And put him up on a pedestal. I mean, he's just a wonderful, just, golly, look at this guy. So the Israelites say to him, say to Gideon, they say, we want you to be our ruler. Gideon, you're such a man, we want you to be our king. 
Well, we know that 300 years later, Saul would actually become the first king. But this is what Gideon told God at the time. He said this, or he told the people, he said, he said, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. It's really the same thing when it got to Saul later on, by the way, if you know that story. Same thing that was supposed to happen then. God says, you know, what am I, what am I just like, you know, mincemeat or something? I'm not important that you need to find this other person. But they picked Saul out all those years later. But at this time, Gideon said, I won't take that job. And what they did is they created a, a, an ephod. They brought all the gold they, that they brought, and they, they made this deal about the size of a five-gallon bucket, if you will. But it was, they made it out of gold and just really just this pretty ornament. But as soon as they did that, here's these crazy people. What do they do? They start worshiping this gold bucket. You know, they got all this happening, all the things that God had done before them. But they start worshiping this gold bucket. And Scripture says that for the next 40 years, though, they still lived at peace. I mean, they'd done a number on the people next to them, the neighbors. So they had, they had, a, they had exterminated the immediate problem. But Scripture says this. It says, as soon as Gideon died, the, the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping the images of Baal, their God. Wow. All that happened. And in the course of that period of time, how quickly they forgot. They forgot that the Lord who had rescued them from their enemies and all the people surrounded them, and they didn't show any loyalty even to that family after his death. Now, teaser five is on your list is recycling. Recycling. See, the people of Israel went through this same cycle. I mean, they'd, you know, they'd call on the Lord, the Lord would bail them out. Well, here we go again. Here's Baal. Here's whoever. You know, they, just another God, another God, another God. And they kept doing this same thing in this recycling. And, you know, we shouldn't have to do that. We have God's word. We have the encouragement of other believers around us. We shouldn't have to do those things. We shouldn't have to go back and live through this same process and say, Lord, bring me near, bring me near. No, I'm farther, farther. Bro, bring me near. We shouldn't have to do that. We have things in front of us, but we have to be on our game. So I'm going to take you back to those five principles again as we close. This is, this is the first one. Why me? See, Scripture, and I talked about this some weeks ago, in Scripture in Matthew said, in this world, you will have trouble. And somebody pretty important said that. Jesus Christ. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. This is not going to be just a cakewalk through life. Whether you're a believer or not, in this world, you will have trouble. But then I like what Psalm says about that, too. When we think about that, why me? Psalm says this in Psalms 46. It says, God is our refuge and strength. God is our refuge and strength. And I really like this line when I go back and read it. It said, it's the very present help in trouble. I'm glad they put present in there. Not past, not used to be, but, he, but it, Scripture tells us that God is our refuge and our strength and a very present help in trouble. Second one was this, I am sending you. In not too, in a few weeks, we're going to start a, a study about Hebrews 11, and it's really kind of what they call the, 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 the heroes of our faith is, who, is who's kind of ticked off in Hebrews 11, and we're going to go through those. But I think it's interesting because many of us sitting here, I mean, if we were to go back and, and think, wonder how life's been. You know, I was raised in church, never stepped across the yellow lines, I didn't ever speed, I didn't do anything stupid. I didn't have any fractured relationships. Everything was good. And here I am today, just a wonderful believer. If I ask all those to stay today, wouldn't be very many people left in here, if any. But see, that's what Hebrews 11 teaches us, is that what God does is he takes the imperfect and he makes it into the perfect. He makes it into the perfect. He told the, he told the disciples, and, the, and they were a long way from being perfect. He told the disciples before they left, he said this. He said, he said, what you need to do is you need to go forth into the world 
and take my word, baptizing people as you go. That's what he told them, which is really us. So when he said, I'm sending you, that's, that's us, right? I'm sending you. The third thing was the bold step we talked about. Many of us spend our time waiting for somebody else to do the bold step. We do, don't we? Somebody else can do that. That's a bold step. All right. Well, I tell you what I'll do. I'll tell the pastor. Or I'll t- you know, somebody else can do this. But we wait for somebody else to do that. But yet, when we're talking about the bold step, we need to be careful because a bold step, when you take it, isn't based on how we feel. It's not based on our emotion. It's not based on some thing about our pride. It's based on when the Holy Spirit comes into you and prompts you to do something. And it's not generated out of our pride. But sometimes we are called in our family, in our workplace, in our church, in our community to take a bold step. The fourth one was was the something only God can do. See, we saw that example when he went from uh, 32,000 people to 300, gave them the victory and hardly had to, to do any battle. Because we know that that can happen. So what we need to do is, you know, those things still happen today. There are things that still happen today that only God could have done. And we need to be watching for those things. And we shouldn't be shy because if you have things in your life, I have things in my life, we shouldn't be shy about saying, God, I know that this seems to be an impossible ask, but you're God. We shouldn't be ashamed or afraid or shy about asking him to do that. And the last one is this, recycling. It's not, a, it's not really like, unlike the behavior of the Israelites. You know, we, it's, you know, we tend to, as Christians, a lot of us, we tend to migrate from this time where we have a really close relationship. You know, there's an old song by Andre Crouch that says, Take me back. Take me back. Take me back to when I first believed. Because that was a sweet time. And, you know, and what we do is we, we see that happen, but then if we're not careful, what happens is all this other stuff called life gets in the way. Our relationship starts to be minimized. We start to listen to other people and other people's opinion and, and guide our life by, God forbid, Facebook. But the reality is, is, is that's, we're not, we, we can be, you know, if we're not careful, we're recycled like these Israelites. Up and down and up and down and up and down. But our life doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. We can, we, can live, we, can, we can be on our knees and we can ask the Lord, Lord, be in charge of my decisions, be in charge of my family. Those are the things we know we can do. I'm going to leave that with you today. But again, one of the things I asked you to do when we started was this. Of those five things we talked about, maybe the Lord's quickened you about something on that list. I'm not asking you to drop it in the box, or you can if you want to, but I'm just asking you, circle that for your own self. Because if you know that's something that you're really being worked on about, it's a great thing to ponder this week and to pray about and say, God, what is it that you want me to do about that particular circumstance? Because I know that what he doesn't mean for us to do is just mill around like a bunch of sheep. He means for us to be involved in action, involved in life changes, involved in improving things for our family, for our neighborhood, for our schools, whatever those things, wherever he puts you. So bow your head. Now, what's going to happen? Brian's going to come and play for us a minute. I'm going to be handy. Coach will be handy. If there's any of you that need to do some business with us down here, we're going to be down here just for a short period of time. Don't tarry, okay? If you mean it, mean it. Get up. But if you don't, that's okay. We're going to just have a short time together, and then we'll be dismissed. Let me pray for us. Father, I just ask you as we, uh, as we close today that you've given this lesson about Gideon and he, he was kind of picked out of, a, of an unlikely bunch, just like we are. And Father, you asked him to do some things and he was faithful in doing it. And Lord, I'd ask you that as we think about our life and about where we're at and our, how close we are, are we on some diverging path right now, Lord, or are we... Are we getting closer? Are we converging, getting closer and closer all the time to you? That's my prayer in Jesus' name.